that's, that's tremendous. And uh, we don't want this to become a mechanical kind of thing, you know, where we just kind of schedule trips to open arms. But uh, as Linda said, um, if we all show up at the same time, it is a problem. Uh, not as much a problem now as it used to be, because when they were meeting in uh, Doug and Lil's uh, lower level, uh, it was a big problem um, because of lack of room. But still, it's just a good idea to spread those visits out and uh, and and to think a little bit strategically about it, just uh, so that we're um, you know really encouraging them. It's been th uh, three years, as Linda mentioned, and and uh, for the first uh, while they had lots of people going down to visit, but lately we've noticed uh, they've noticed uh, they don't see people as often, and uh, I guess that's kind of maybe to be expected. But we just want to really be uh, be encouraging them as much as we can. And uh, didn't, uh, didn't the worship band do an awesome job tonight? Woo! Yeah. <laughs> really enjoyed. Really enjoyed that. Yeah. <clears throat> we, um, when we changed our um, uh, service time for the weekend to tonight, instead of tomorrow morning, to make room for the... Uh, uh, for the veterans to use our facility for the Remembrance Day uh, service tomorrow morning. Um, we uh, uh, wanted to be mindful of the time, especially for the sake of the children. And so what we normally normally plan for our services to be an hour and a half long and they end up being an hour and 45 minutes quite often. Uh, tonight our plan was to uh, be an hour and 15 minutes. And uh, well, we were kind of hoping to get, get you out of here by, by a quarter to eight. And looking at the clock, I'm thinking, wow, that... We're, we're doing we're doing pretty good here now now we're uh, we're about to experience the weakest leak in the chain um, <clears throat> uh, but um, but I am I am I am privileged tonight to be able to share God's word with you and I'm excited about about the uh, passage that we're going to be looking at together tonight because it's one of those passages that um, I don't know, it's like, uh, how, many, how many of you, when you were little, uh, went to uh, Sunday school or, or something along that line and learned the stories? Yeah, a good number of you. And you would have learned uh, all of the stories of the Old Testament as well as the story of the New Testament. And uh, you would have heard uh, about uh, Jacob and Esau. And that's uh, what we're going to be looking at uh, this evening, and uh, so I just uh, maybe invite you to, to pray with me one more time as we just uh, approach uh, the word together tonight. Lord, thank you for this tremendous group of people and for the great privilege that is ours tonight to gather here in your name. And uh, Lord, we do gather in, in the mighty name of Jesus because we are mindful of the fact that it's not just the, that we're, we've come together tonight but that we've come together to worship you. And that we haven't just gathered in this place, that we've gathered here with the uh, acknowledging, uh, acknowledgement of your presence in our midst. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence tonight. We thank you that we could sing those incre incredible song lyrics and think about um, how m much it means for us to have the, the foundation of the cornerstone of Jesus Christ that we can build our lives, and Jesus invites us to build our lives upon him and his truth and, and um, his love and his grace. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to come and to give your life for us so that we could know uh, you and have a relationship with our, with our God and have you, uh, Father, as our Heavenly Father. We thank you for these things. They're just um, wonderful beyond words. Now, as we look at your word tonight, we, uh, we pray that you would bless it to our hearts, and we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is truth, and that we can depend on your word, and, that we, and you invite us uh, to learn and to study and to listen and to read and, and to pray through your word. Lord, I thank you tonight for how your word <coughs> reveals you to us. And we pray that you would do just that tonight by the power of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week we learned about the prophetic birth of Jacob and Esau. And then we read this passage together. 
that uh, narrates the story after the birth, and that's Genesis 25, verses 27 to 34, where I want to read now. It says, When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking stew, Esau came in from the field and he was exhausted. And Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stew for I am exhausted. Therefore, his name is called Edom. Jacob said, sell me your birthright now. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, swear to me now. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went his way. And then this concluding statement, thus Esau despised his birthright. God had told Rebekah before the twins were born that the older would serve the younger, which was a way of saying that the second born would have the rights of the firstborn, which is another way of saying that the secondborn would be the chosen one and not the firstborn. And this passage that we've just read just now begins to describe how that prediction was fulfilled in their early lives. Um, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. A single meal. Uh, once again, the book of Hebrews sheds uh, amazing light on these passages. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 15 through 17, which we have on the screen right now, is a case in point. It says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled, that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you, it goes on to say in verse 17, For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. <clears throat> Interesting, isn't it? Uh, Esau is referred to here uh, as someone who uh, we should uh, hold up as an example of, of, uh, of what we should not be like because according to Hebrews uh, 12, he was uh, unholy and sexually immoral. And it's curious because no passage that in the Old Testament that I, unless there's something in the prophets that I... I'm unaware of, uh, or don't recall reading, there's no passage that talks about uh, Esau being sexually immoral or any of his sexual escapades, if you will. Uh, and so it causes me to wonder, what does uh, sexual morality have to do with uh, what we're reading here? And, and uh, I, I think uh, we can surmise that, um, that the correlation is one where uh, we could say that a sexually immoral person is someone who puts carnal uh, desires or sensual pleasures ahead of God's design and instructions for our lives. Uh, whether it's a dish or a dish, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? It's similar. There's a similarity. There's a correlation. Um, because this here Hebrews passage is a divine commentary on the source and the sort of choices that Esau made. Esau chose to despise his birthright and he suffered the reper repercussions of that choice. But God had already set all those choices, all those things in motion to accomplish his will. We talked about that last week. Uh, these are sobering thoughts. Uh, it's a sobering thought for me uh, it causes me to think about my own uh, love affair with food. You know, when it says that Esau came in and he was exhausted, I, you, know, you know what that, that, exhausted, we think of exhausted as tired. 
okay? Well, he probably was tired. But exhausted, if you think about the word, you know, it's, it's, your strength's gone. Well, where do you get strength? What was he wanting food for? How do you, what do you like when you get exhausted? I know what I'm like. It's like nothing matters but food. Don't talk to me, just feed me. Don't expect me to be nice until you give me a burger. <laughs> then we can talk. <laughs> and uh, yeah. There's nothing wrong with the desires that we have that are God-given desires. But when we allow those desires to take over our lives, or if we allow them to take us outside of the boundaries set by God, they become what, the, what we could call inordinate desires. And so that becomes the issue. It's not the desires wrong. There's nothing wrong with the desire for food, obviously. Uh, but it becomes wrong when, it, when it's out of order, out of place. And the, that's, the, that's, what, that's what the passage is conveying here, that, that, that uh, um, Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. And that's what is being emphasized here. So um, these things apply to uh, Esau, but they apply to more than just Esau. It says there that uh, the passage we read in uh, verse 27 and 28, it says, When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man dwelling in tents. And then it says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. So it seems that it wasn't just Esau that was governed by his appetites, that Isaac as well was to some degree governed by his appetites. And this is an important consideration to keep in mind as we go through our text this evening, which is Genesis 27 and 28. Uh, so reading in verse uh, 1 through 4 of Genesis 27, the story continues with these words. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and he said to him, My son. <clears throat> and he answered, Here I am. And he said, I am, Behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now then, take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out in the field and hunt game for me. And then prepare for me a delicious, some delicious food, such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. As Wayne Linklater would say, num, num, num. That's what he says. Um, so Esau was a man led by his physical impulses and urges. Uh, apparently, so was Isaac. But there are other key uh, characters in the storyline, right? Who are they? Rebecca and Jacob. So reading at verse 5 and following, uh, of chapter 27. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. So when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I've heard your father speak uh, to your brother um, Esau. And he said, bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless you before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two young goats so that I may prepare them. Uh, from them some delicious food for your father, such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat, so that he may bless you before he dies. Uh, but Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be mocking him, and bring a curse upon myself, not a blessing. His mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice, and go bring them to me. Which is another way of saying, You let me worry about that. You just do as I told you. So he went, verse 14, and took them and brought them to his mother and his mother to prepare delicious food such as his father loved. And Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her older son, which were with him in the house and put them on Jacob, her younger uh, son. And the skins of the young goats she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. So, Rebecca and Jacob, <clears throat> Rebecca 
heard, I overheard uh, J- uh, Isaac talking to their oldest son Esau, and she uh, she immediately start to, started to plan, uh, and they, they, she cooked up a plan, and uh, she brought Jacob into the plan, and it seems like Jacob's kind of, just kind of, at this point, maybe going along with her, and uh, you know, if you speculate, speculate a little bit about Rebecca, you wonder if she maybe is uh, justifying all of this in her mind. Why? Why would she be justifying this in her mind? Why, much, why might she be justifying this in her mind? Pardon? Well, she was wrong, yeah. She was, she was wrong, but what, what might she have been thinking? The promise. That Jacob was going to come out on top. Not Esau. Remember, God had told her to that, told her that in no uncertain terms, and she knew that. So, so uh, if you know, if uh, she was <clears throat> justifying this and thinking that uh, you know uh, the end justifies the means approach, if if she was taking an end justifies the means approach, she wouldn't be the first person or the last person to do that. And we can rationalize uh, things in our minds sometimes, can't we? So maybe, you know, we, we, we could do something like this. We could say, well, we know God wants to bless us. He wants us to have good things. Right? He wants us to be blessed. He wants us to, uh, to do well. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe if it takes cutting a corner here or there, but does it really matter? All that really matters is the end, right? It's like where things end up. That's, that's what matters, right? Do we ever do that? Sometimes we do. But we shouldn't. Because the truth of the matter is, is that God does not need our help in these matters. God does not need our help fulfilling those types of, of, of things. Uh, self-promotion is not God's part of God's intention to bless us. You know, Jesus said this. He said, "He who um, humbles himself, he who exalts himself, will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted." And God does want to lift us up. God promises, promises us that in some way, shape, or form, we will be lifted up. We will be promoted. But if we take that into our hands, what happens? God's not honored with that, is he? Self-promotion is not God's plan for your future or mine. And the reason that God reveals his sovereign will to us is, is so that we will trust him and obey him. Not so that we'll take matters in our own hands. We should never take those types of matters in our, our own hands. And we should never think for even one second that the, uh, we should never think of the sovereignty of God uh, in, any, in some way that somehow makes God complicit in our sin. Because God is never complicit in our sin. You know, the phrase here that strikes me as interesting is at the very end of that passage we read where it says Rebecca took, after she did all the scheming and the planning and did everything that she could do in her uh, manipulative mind. I don't mean to speak ill of women, but let's just be honest. Okay, It says that she took the dish, the food, and she put it in Jacob's hand. And uh, I, I find that interesting because it, it's, on the one hand, it's like she's saying, okay, it's in your hands now. I've done everything I can, I can do for you. Uh, you've got to take it from here. And um, the phraseology is interesting because when we think of something being in our hands, I think it's pertinent to the whole discussion that that's, this whole passage is steeped in. It's a discussion of the sovereignty of God versus the uh, the, the, the free uh, we call, what we call free will or the the choices that we make as human beings. And when we say something is in our hands, that's that's kind of what we mean, isn't it? 
It's, it's in our hands. It's, it's up to us. And I just find it interesting that it says there that she put it in his hand. Or else we say we put our hand to something. Same, same thing. Our hands are very symbolic, aren't they? Our hands are what we do things with. In many ways, uh, um, we, our hands represent us. That's why when we greet somebody, often we'll greet somebody with a handshake. It's, all, it's also, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, God having hands. Now, God doesn't have hands. That's a, uh, what is that? Anthropomorphism. Very good. I knew you knew. Um, that's when we ascribe uh, human features to, to God. Uh, and we, you know, God doesn't have a body. Now, Jesus, he has hands. So I guess you could argue that God has hands now. He has nail-pierced hands. But, but anyways, I'm... Am I off track? I am off track. Um, the important thing is, is that we talk about God, we talk about our lives being what? In God's hands. What do we mean by that? We mean that, that God uh, takes responsibility and, and, and uh, uh, he's in control of our lives. Right? Um, so this, this is all quite interesting, I think, in relation to that whole subject that is, that's... Um, that's, uh, that's right here, that, that whole theme. That not just here, throughout Scripture, but it's, it's uh, graphic here, isn't it? That whole tension between God's will and God's plan and God's uh, prophetic uh, predictions and our choosing. And uh, so she puts it, uh, she puts it in, in his hand. We're going to be looking next month at uh, Joseph. And that's another striking example of, of how people uh, scheme and work and plan and, and connive, and yet God's will is done. Um, but the greatest example is what? The greatest example of that tension between the responsibility of us as human beings to choose and act and do, either rightly or wrongly, and God's sovereign purpose and will is what? Prayer, we talked about that last week, it's where the, the two come together. But the greatest biblical example of, uh, of, the, of the narrative of the scriptures is the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, right? Look, take a look at this passage, Acts 2.23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Interesting, eh? Jesus was delivered up or over according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, but you crucified him. This is Peter preaching on the day of Pentecost, preaching to, to the, the, the Jews from, uh, who had gathered there, um, but you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. That's the responsibility. That's the human responsibility there. And over in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, 28, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, that's pretty much the whole gang, to do what your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Interesting, eh? I find it fascinating how the Bible teaches that he's got the whole world in his hands. He is sovereign, he is Lord, his will is supreme. He, know, he knows what, it, what is, look, we talk about the greatness of God. We talk about, about how big God is and that's part of this whole thing is understanding how big God is. Our view of God is too small. We need a bigger view of God. We need a higher view of God. We need an elevated view of God. We need to see God more like how he really is as opposed to the little uh, 
the little vision that we tend to have of God because we tend to envision God in our own image rather than the other way around. But God is so great. And, his, and, and take his knowledge, for example. When you think of the knowledge of God, God's knowledge is so great that not only does God know everything that has happened, he knows everything that's going to happen. But it's greater than that and it's bigger than that because God knows everything that would happen. Theologians call that knowledge of God middle knowledge. Just think about it for a moment. God knows every possible scenario. You know, you take, you know, you take a, one of those there um, Excel spreadsheets and you, and you figure out this really uh, complicated formula and you set it up so this this square here, or this uh, cell here, times this cell here, divided by this cell over here, and, and you have this whole complicated thing, and if you change one cell, it changes everything else in relation to it, and changes the, 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 the uh, uh, total, you know? Pretty amazing, right? Well, the God we read about in Scripture, he, 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 he does that about everything that ever has happened, ever will happen, or ever would have happened if we were to change one single incident. He knows all of the, what theologians call, call the counterfactuals, not just the facts or the factuals, but the counterfactuals. And that's just really just a, a small inkling of the greatness of the mind of God and the understanding and the knowledge of God and the rightful thing for us to do is to humble ourselves uh, before him. Take a look at this quote. Uh, this is from a book by um, uh, Randy Alcorn, uh, who wrote a book called Hand in Hand. And you notice that Hand in Hand, it's a good name for a book, eh? Hand in Hand. You notice uh, the title of the book, he's got a little H. That looks funny, doesn't it? But that's the, that's the way he titled the book. Why would he do that? Right. Our hand with a little h, God's hand with the capital H. Hand, our hand in God's hand. And, uh, but but there, you see the quote? God of scriptures is so big, wise, and powerful that he can grant truly meaningful and real choices to angels and humans alike in a way that allows them to act freely within their finite limits without inhibiting his sovereign plan in any way. And indeed, using their meaningful choices, even their disobedience, in a significant way, to fulfill his sovereign plan. How does God do that? We do not know. We don't know how he does it. That's right. Genesis chapter 50. Uh, in the life of Joseph. Yep. We can't wrap our, our finite minds around it, but we do need to let it sink in just how great and how um, big God is. Let's read on in the text. Genesis 27, verses 18 and 20. So he went into his father, and he said, My father. And he said, Here I am. Who are you, my son? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. Who is this? Who's talking here? Jacob. Okay, you're with me. Okay. I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up. And eat my game, that my, your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, How is it that you have found it so quickly, my son? He answered, Because the Lord your God granted me success. So up to this point, it's pretty much been Rebecca doing the scheming, and Jacob's just kind of been going along, or at least it appears that way. But that all changes here, doesn't it? Jacob is fully engaged now, and he's... Uh, fully incriminating himself, without question. And, uh, and he, he, he brings the Lord's name into it. I think you could call that swearing, uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. Don't you think? Is that, is that serious stuff? That's serious stuff. Notice, though, that Jacob says, you're God. And that might be an indication, possibly, that Jacob really doesn't have a personal relationship with God at this point uh, and there's good reason to conclude that he doesn't because as we're going to see as we read on in the scriptures that he is yet to encounter uh, 
God in the way that he soon will. But that point's coming. Genesis 27, verses 21 through 24. Then Isaac said to Jacob, Please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you really are my Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, The voice is Jacob's, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands. So he blessed him. He said, Are you really... My son, Esau? And Jacob answered, I am. That's quite obvious in the way this is recorded uh, that the author wants us to see the full indictment here against Jacob. There's absolutely no mistaking his culpability here. He is guilty as sin. He's had, Isaac has given him multiple opportunities and here he just told a bold-faced lie right to his father's face. Let's keep reading. Verse 25 through 29. Then he said, um, that's Isaac, said, Bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate. And he brought him, brought him wine and he drank. And then his father Isaac said to him, Come near and kiss me, my son. So he came near and kissed him. And Isaac smelled the smell of his garment. <sighs> Nothing like the smell of the open fields. And he blessed him. And he said, See the smell, which is interesting for somebody that's blind. See, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God Give you of the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let the people serve you. The nations bow, to you, bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. And thus Isaac blessed Jacob thinking that he was Esau. He gave Esau, or gave Jacob Esau's blessing. We shouldn't miss the fact here, because I think it's intentional the way the story is told, that Isaac was deceived by his senses. Did you notice that? He, uh, he was deceived by his sight, of course, because his eyes were failing him. He was deceived by his sense of smell. He was deceived by his sense of touch. And he was deceived by his sense of taste. About the only thing he had going for him was his hearing, which they always say is the last thing to go. Linda, is that right? I don't mean that you're, that you're losing all your senses, Linda. I just mean that I know you work with a lot of people that... Okay, you know what I mean. Never mind. Let me ask somebody else. Vance, is that true? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> the, the significance is, is that Esau and Isaac are both portrayed, uh, somewhat at least, as sensualists. And, uh, you know, the text says that, uh, that Esau favored his son, or uh, sorry, Isaac favored his son Esau. Why? What does the text say? It's verse 28. What's it say? Isaac favored Jacob because why? Did anybody bring the Bible? Was it? He ate of the what? Turn the lights up back there a little bit there, Dave. Like, the people can't see. What's it say? Maybe, my, maybe, maybe several of you have answered, and my hearing is so bad I didn't hear you. I don't know. That's possible. Because he had a taste for wild game. I think the, um, yeah, 
I think the uh, ESV was what I was reading in. It states, it states the same thing, so slightly different. Uh, it says that, um, it says, uh, he, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game. Uh, that was what the text I was trying to quote, or the verse I was trying to quote. But yeah, that, so think about that. You, you have children? Do you love one more than the other? Or others? Why would a parent do that? Seems like a pretty carnal thing to me. All right? So don't get upset with me because I said that Isaac is, is a sensualist. I mean, it's right there in the text. It's there intentionally. God has put this in the story line, uh, brought it out of, of, the, of these accounts for us so that we can look at it and, and, and learn from it. And we, we do need to learn uh, from that, don't we? The blessing uh, here is a very big deal. Among other things, it conferred the uh, right to rule over the family after the patriarch's death. And so it, it was a really, a really big deal. Now, it's a little hard for us to relate to this in our culture because uh, we pretty much lost the, sense of, the whole sense of heritage. You know, honestly, we, we really have. You know, um, uh, but the, and, and about the only, the only time we think of even uh, the concept of inheritance is when there's money involved. <laughs> you know, like, we, we've lost this. We've lost it. It's gone out of our culture. I don't know. I don't think we'll ever get it back. Uh, as Christians, uh, we need to work at that. Um, anyways, the text goes on to say that Jacob had barely left the room when Esau comes bounding in, all excited. <sighs> all right, I'm here. Let's do this. And uh, I hope you have read or you will read what happens because we're not going to read that tonight, but it's, it's not good. It's not good. Uh, for Jacob's part in all this, uh, his intention seemed to be to come out on top and to get the blessing, no matter what the cost, or no matter who he had to defraud to get it, which is ironic, considering that God had promised it to him. You know? So what about the cost? What did it cost? What were the consequences? What were the repercussions? It's rather obvious what the cost was to Esau. He was devastated. The text says that he, uh, he cried an exceeding great and bitter cry. Verse 34. It's one of those like from the depths of his soul come out this incredible, like a, like a, a child in pain. Um, but Jacob wasn't there to hear it. Did he care? We're not sure. There's no indication in the text that he cared. Do you ever wonder about people who basically make their way of life by stealing and defrauding other people? I mean, you know, someone works hard for what they have and somebody else comes along by stealth and just takes it away and lives off it. You ever wonder about those people? I wonder about those people all the time. I, in fact, I even wonder about, as I drive down the road and see all the garbage on the side of the road, I wonder about the people that throw the garbage out the window. I'm thinking, what goes on in those people's minds? Or the people, do you know there's people out there that don't, that don't work for a living, they just steal. And uh, you wonder, you know, I wonder, do they, do they lie awake in bed at night and think about it? Maybe they don't. But that doesn't mean there are no consequences. There are no costs. The text says that um, Esau hated, verse uh, 41, Esau hated his brother. And he began from that very moment to plan to kill him. Well, that's a pretty significant consequence when you make those types of enemies, especially in your own family, and the breakdown of your, only, of your own family? I mean, think, think about that. Yeah, Jacob 
got ahead. What did he lose? What did he pay? What did it cost him? Maybe he wasn't thinking about that. He certainly hadn't thought it through. That's for sure. Because the cost was immeasurable. But it gets bigger. It gets way bigger. Genesis 27, verses 43 through 46. Rebecca. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice. Arise, flee to Laban, my brother in Haran, and stay with him a while until uh, your brother's fury turns away, until your brother's anger turns away from you and he forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send and bring you from there. Why should I be bereft of you both in one day? Then Rebekah said to Isaac, I loathe my life because of the Hittite women. If Jacob marries uh, one of the uh, Hittite women like these, one of the women of the land, what good will my life be to me? And so they prepare to send him away. And in chapter 28, that's what they do. They send him away. What were the costs? What were the repercussions? Well, here's one. Rebekah would never see Jacob ever again. At least not this side of heaven. That's a pretty serious repercussion. Chapter 28, verses 10 through 22. Jacob left Beersheba and went over toward Har- Haran, I think it's called. I, I hear it pronounced. And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The lamb on which you lie I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and you, in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. What is that? That's the reiteration of the covenant promise that God made to his grandfather Abraham and to his father Isaac and now to him, to Jacob. He is the promised one, he, the, the, the child of promise. He is the chosen one. He's the receiving, a receiver of the promise. And it says, Behold, I am with you, verse 15, and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob woke up, verse 16 from his sleep. And he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. And he was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. And and this is the gate of heaven. Now, as near as we can tell from previous passages of Abraham and uh, and, uh, Isaac, God never put them, you know, they weren't sleeping when God spoke to them. But but this is how God chose to reveal himself here to, to Jacob. And so it says, early in the morning, verse 18, Jacob took the stone that he had put under his head and he set it up for a pillar and he poured oil on the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. Uh, but the name of the city was Luz at the first. Um, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and, I, and will keep me in this way that I go, I will give him or sorry, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I have set up here as a pillar shall be his house. And of all that you give me, I will give you uh, a full, a tenth back to you. And there's lots that could be said about that for sure. But So here we have Jacob heading off into exile. And he's one day's travel out. It's night's coming, dark, getting dark. So he lays down and he goes to sleep and he dreams of, of heaven. It's kind of interesting. And then we have this reiteration of the covenant. And uh, when you read through here, uh, you know, I, I guess we could read through and, and start to think, you know, this is, it, it's a little unsettling to think that Jacob uh, was the kind of, um, um, despicable scoundrel that he was and yet after all the scheming and the deceiving and the cheating and the stealing he ends up with the blessing and now uh, he's not even around to hear his brother uh, 
weep, or his mother, I'm thinking, probably, because he just, he just got out of Dodge. And uh, it's kind of like in the movies, you know, and you have these guys that pull this great big bank heist, and next thing you know, the, the, they're starting, just before they roll the credits, they're all living in some uh, luxury beach house somewhere in the tropics, right? Living the life of Riley. And, uh, but that's only in the movies, isn't it? Maybe. You know, we have thinking about the repercussions. God chose Jacob. No question. But that didn't mean that Jacob got a pass. Jacob didn't get a pass on the consequences of his actions. And we need to stand up and take note of that. It might seem like he did, but he didn't get a pass. Even, even here in this place where he is now, he has a stone for a pillow. I know he probably had other things for a pillow too. I'm, I'm sure he had blankets. I'm sure he could roll one up. But, but the text includes, I believe the, the text includes this because Jacob is now in a barren place. He's in a barren place. And he's all alone. He's gone from having a family to having nobody, just him. And he's alienated himself. And, and, and it's his own fault. He can't blame anybody. And so he sets out on this trip, which would be very... I, I, I checked the mileage on this, and Vicki uh, Linkletter, it would be like you walking from here to New Hampshire. That'd be a long walk, wouldn't it? And when you got there, you wouldn't feel like turning around and walking back, I'm thinking, right? It's going to be a long, long way from home. 20 years. We call that a life sentence. But that's how long Jacob will be in uh, Padanaram or Haran. And uh, he, uh, he's, going to be, uh, he's going to meet his uncle Laban there. And if you come here next Sunday morning, you'll hear Jerry share with us, because I hope to be here, all about uh, the schooling that he got from his Uncle Laban. It's pretty interesting. You ever hear the expression, what goes around comes around? Do you know what it means? It means this. It means that Jacob did not get a pass. He bore the repercussions of his actions. Um, and it's important to note the um, consequences that Jacob uh, suffers in these passages and the severity of his actions and his choices in order to really appreciate God's mercy and his grace to Jacob. Because the Bible is very clear on this, that God chose Jacob. And the, the entire text goes out of the way to show just how unworthy Jacob was. That's a big part of the point here. If you're, if you're looking for a point, that's a big part of getting the point here, is that Jacob was a scoundrel. I have a feeling in two weeks' time that when Doug Lake is here, He's going to talk to you a little bit about uh, Jacob getting a, a, a new name. Because his old name, Jacob, you can interpret it different ways and translate it different ways, but it's not good. And anyways, uh, uh, Romans 9 is all about that. Hebrews 12, we read earlier, 15, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, like Esau. But Jacob... God experienced God's grace and God reached out to Jacob. And, and I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, let me just say that the uh, ladder, uh, they say that commentators uh, say that stairway is a better translation, which would make it the stairway to heaven. All you Led Zeppelin fans out there. Uh, I'm sure there's many of you. Um, I just make, makes me wonder why they didn't translate it stairway then instead of ladder. But, but anyways, the point is Jesus picks it up in the New Testament. Did you know that? Jesus makes reference to this passage in the, in the New Testament. Do you, how many of you knew that? 
I'm sorry, I know it. I know it's past most of your bedtimes, but... Uh, he said this, he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven, he's talking to uh, Nathaniel, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending, uh, sorry, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. That's right out of this passage. Why would Jesus say that? Uh, we could, again, I'm trying to wrap this up and this is not conducive to wrapping anything up but I could take you all the way back to the Tower of Babel where they were trying to make a way to heaven and here God reveals himself to Jacob and it's God making the way and Jesus said what? He said I am the way. Jesus is the stairway to heaven. Jesus is the way to heaven. Jesus is the stairway. He is. This is a picture of God descending with his grace bringing salvation down to you and I. And that's the point with Jacob. If, J- if salvation could be earned, Jacob was blown out of luck because he had nothing to offer God. He had no merit at all. And that's what, the, and, and then when the New Testament picks up the story of Jacob and Esau, that's the point it makes in Romans chapter 9. It's not about merit. It's not about Jacob. God chose Jacob because he was a good guy and God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. No, no, no. They were both, neither one of them were worthy. Neither uh, Jacob nor Esau were worthy. Uh, neither was Isaac. Neither was Rebekah. Neither are you. Neither am I. We are all unworthy. Every single one of us. And it's only by God's grace the promise, the promise is for you and for me. And to our families. They were a dysfunctional family. Think about it. They were a dysfunctional family. Do you know any of those? <laughs> Esau was totally unworthy. Jacob was totally unworthy. Isaac and Rebecca were unworthy. You and I are unworthy. But despite Jacob's unworthiness, God in his great grace chose him as his own. That didn't mean a pass for Jacob. It didn't mean that there weren't repercussions for his actions. But listen, what it did mean is this. It meant that God was going to stick by him no matter what. That's what he said. He said... You know, here's, here's, here's Jacob. Um, why don't you all stand? Here's Jacob. He's heading out. He's in a barren land. He's all alone. Poor young guy. I don't know how old he would have been. Probably not all that old. 60? At this time? He's not even married yet. Jacob? No, no. He hasn't even met his wife yet. Esau. No, uh, you're... You're confusing me. <laughs> you talk, you're sure about Isaac? Well, he's not married. He hasn't even gone to found his wife yet. Look, you just you just stop. You just be quiet. I'm trying to wrap the, I'm trying to wrap this up here. Rick, go back there and do something with her, will you? We'll talk about this again. What was my point? I don't even remember. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he's not a young guy, but he's still, he's still, I still feel sorry for him. Do you feel sorry for him? I feel sorry for him. And one of the reasons I feel sorry for him because I can identify with him. I can identify with all the people in this. There's nothing in this story, any one of these people, I can't go, eh, yeah, they've done stuff like that. But it's not about that. The point is, is that God gave his grace and Jacob responded to the grace of God in his life. It was uh, by God's grace that he responded. And, and, uh, and the Bible, I know that most of you know the Bible when it comes into, when we come into the New Testament and the Bible talks about, about Jesus um, as the way. God makes his grace and his promise available 
to you and I in Jesus Christ. Right? And if you can authentically say, standing here tonight, if you can authentically say that you know God personally through the grace that is in Jesus Christ, then you can claim the promise where he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Behold, Jesus said to his disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's kind of the same promise that he made to Jacob. And he makes that promise to you and I in Jesus Christ. So I guess, you know, what I would like to, to end with is that question to you. Do you know God personally through the grace that is in Jesus Christ? the only way to the Father. That's a question you all all of us have to answer personally, right? But um, will you think about that? And maybe if you can't answer yes to that, maybe uh, that's something you can do something about. Maybe maybe, uh, God would have you respond to his gracious offer to you tonight. It's a good time as any. Actually, it's a better time than almost any. Now is the day of salvation, the Bible says. Don't know if you have tomorrow. In the hospital today visiting somebody. Massive heart attacks. My age. You just don't know, right? Pray with me. Lord, I thank you for every man and woman here today. Uh, Help us, Lord, to know that you have made a way and that it's not about how good we live or how much we merit. And I know, we know, Lord, that there are consequences to how we live our lives and the choices we make. But in the end, none of us are saved by our performance or our abilities or anything about us. Our relationship with you is solely on the basis of your promise and your grace. Help us to see that and understand it and to really get a hold of it, Lord. And I just pray tonight for any who might be here that have not laid hold of that promise that you would enable them to do so even in these moments, these quiet moments, Lord. In the quietness of of their heart that they would just respond to the grace of God as in um, you, Lord Jesus. Amen. If you'd like to talk about any of these things, uh, anybody other than Peggy, um, (laughs) all right, we'll talk. Thank you.